Today on Uncommon Knowledge, freedom of speech on campus. Some restrictions apply. Funding for this program is provided by the John M. Olin Foundation. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Free Speech on Campus. All the evidence indicates that instructors at American universities and colleges are overwhelmingly liberal. According to one recent study, whereas 15% of faculty members describe themselves as conservative, 72% describe themselves as liberal. Why should this matter? Well, According to some critics, the ideological imbalance has created a code of political correctness that inhibits freedom of inquiry and expression. Is this true? If so, what should be done about it? Joining us today, two guests. Graham Larkin is a professor of art history at Stanford University and an official of the American Association of University Professors. David Horowitz is president of the Center for the Study of Popular Culture and the author of The Academic Bill of Rights. George Will, writing about the brouhaha that ensued when Larry Summers, president of Harvard, suggested that there might be innate cognitive differences between men and women. Quote, forgive Larry Summers. He thought he was speaking in a place that encourages uncircumscribed intellectual explorations. He was not. He was on a university campus. Close quote. Is there indeed a code of political correctness that inhibits, truly and substantially inhibits, freedom of inquiry in American universities. David? Well, of course. Um, th these faculty members are totalitarians who do not want to hear um, certain views, and they dominate uh, university faculties. And if they can bring Larry Summers, a former cabinet member in the Clinton administration and a distinguished scholar, to his knees, humiliating himself, begging for his job, and doing the uh, we're familiar with the show trials of the 30s things of Maya culping it all over. Imagine what these professors do uh, to other professors and to students. Graham? Well, as someone who spent eight years at Harvard, uh, I found it to be very ideologically diverse and very open, so that doesn't jive with my experience. All right. Listen to the results of a recent study. By their own description, 72% of those teaching in American institutions of higher learning are liberal call themselves liberal, while only 15% call themselves conservative. At elite institutions, it's even more lopsided. 87% of faculties describe themselves as liberal, and only 13% as conservative. Now, on the very face of it, doesn't that suggest that the conservative point of view is discriminated against in American higher education? Graham? Well, I'm deeply suspicious of any statistics that uh, try to lump people, even on the basis of their self-description, in into just two groups, unless maybe it's male and female. Yeah, there's there are 300 groups, but 290 of them are on the left, and 10 of them are on the right. Um, obviously, there's diversity within the left. The fact is that when you have these radical, uh, what happened at Harvard was the radical feminists marched out of the room and formed a lynch mob. Against and then Larry the, Summers. Against Larry Summers, and then the rest of the left joined them. Now, they don't happen to be a majority of the whole faculty. So you know, I would say at Harvard, the majority of the faculty are mildly, uh, you know, are liberal to one degree. They right. probably all voted for Kerry. Right. But the radicals have the ability to silence and to uh, intimidate the rest of the faculty because they will call you a racist at the drop of a hat or a sexist or a homophobe. They'll get rough. They'll and get rough right away. Yeah. Can I, but I just, well, I just, it just so rough, happens so that this, this yeah. winter and spring we've got at least three studies that I'm aware of. I didn't want to quote them all because I didn't want to laid, laden us with statistics. Right. But uh, another one it was a self-described Republican versus Democrat. And there were also some libertarians and people who call themselves greens in there and so forth. And again, you get the same result. And American universities, faculties are hugely lopsided in the Democratic direction as opposed to Republican direction. Now, you're not, are, are you, you're not going to suggest that those statistics are in error, are you? That they actually are balanced? 
ideologically and politically? Well, the statistics I've seen tend to be uh, selective on the one hand. I mean, they choose uh, often. They don't. They're not from business schools. They're not. I mean, in, in this case, was it across the board? The ones you're talking about? Was it engineering of business schools as well, or was it just humanities? Well, was I don't have them at, uh, right, right here. Right. But this I is what's important. Just off the details of who. One I mean, of them those was a study. Matter a lot. One of them was a study of six professional academic associations. Then another was a study. Two others, That's as I the recall. Klein study. The yeah, Rothman the Lichter study. study is across the board. Right. First of all, universities are very conformist institutions anyway. Mm -hmm. But you live, uh, you, you don't want to be called racist or sexist. You don't want to be boycotted. I, uh, I was at Roger Williams University, and a Democrat on the faculty actually sponsored the college Republicans and told me that that was the end of her invites to dinner parties. So you, you have a totalitarian mentality. Well, it's ruthless, it's witch hunting, and the reason... Let's take a look at one explanation for the ideological imbalance on college campuses. Listen to Paul Krugman, New York Times columnist. Quote, one answer as to how all of this came about, to the extent that there is ideological imbalance, one answer is self-selection. The same sort of self-selection that leads Republicans to outnumber Democrats four to one in the military. The sort of person who prefers an academic career is likely to be somewhat more liberal than average, close quote. Self-selection, it's innocent, and we shouldn't worry about it. What do you make of that? Well, again, I'd like to, I think we need to get back to this idea of left and right. I don't think we've really fully addressed that. I mean, David has said that, uh, uh, you know, most, uh, there's a, radi a radical contingent. If we can get back to Summers just for a second, in, in which I wasn't allowed to, uh, didn't, didn't have the chance to, to speak. Um, the Summers case, it wasn't a matter of just a few radicals. I mean, most of the university, and they, 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 they had a vote in, in which the professors came out en masse against Summers. Okay, so let's, tr let's try it. Let's uh, wrong. Uh, there was about 200. It was a very close vote. Well, uh, it was a close okay, vote of something, whatever, like 230 to 170, but there are 1,000 uh, professors. Well, I mean, this is the way politics works. The right. uh, zealous uh, fanatics uh, come to meetings, and they come early, and they leave late, and they dominate them. So the search and hiring committees are controlled by the radicals who will not allow conservatives to be hired. Paul Krugman's argument that it's natural. It just happens naturally. Yeah, he the also said the Republican Party is governed by revelation instead of reason. This is a f another fanatic yeah, but there's, listen, completely th self-discrediting. Yes, there is self-selection. However... When you are told from the time you're a freshman uh, that your professors and the college, the community in control of the college, which has only been in control of these colleges since the 60s, really since the 70s, for 30 years, that they hate George Bush with a passion, then people who are looking for careers in the university gradually internally adjust, and either they leave the university or they come out liberals and go on into graduate school. If you are a, you know, if you're a... Why are you, now, answer this man. Why are you well, chirping I'm trying this to, if I, now, David, I know that you're against affirmative action. You just made that clear in what I'm you just said. Race you say you're against I'm against you're racist right. Race affirmative action is not, but political affirmative right. action seems to be okay. And I see the very much that? the, you know I see what you're doing is using very much the same kind of politics of resentment that led to affirmative action on racial I grounds. Or, may I speak, sir? On, on, on racial grounds and on uh, political grounds and uh, ideological grounds in the 80s, uh, the stuff, the, uh, you know, the very movements that uh, conservatives came out very articulately against. And now I see you're trying to do a similar thing. Uh, and Grant, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, 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 I, I, this is, I want to speak to this. Just this idea of affirmative action. The first principles of my academic Bill of Rights are you can't hire anybody on the basis of their political views. It's anti-affirmative uh, action, it's anti-quotas, it's anti-the ideological monopoly that the American Association of University Professors uh, have established on virtually every college speech campus in this country. We will locally. come to the next campus speech codes. Recent years, speech codes of various kinds have been adopted at colleges and universities across the country. Now, here are several specific examples. This is objectively the case. Bowdoin College has banned jokes and stories, quote, experienced by others as harassing. These quotations come from college's own materials, websites, and other materials. Brown University has banned, quote, verbal behavior that produces, quote, feelings of impotence, anger, or disenfranchisement, quote, whether intentional or unintentional, close quote. Colby College has outlawed speech that causes, quote, a vague sense of danger, close quote, or a loss of, quote, self-esteem, close quote. All right, so 
We've got speech codes all over the place, and Lord knows there are dozens more examples than these that I could have cited. Would you care to defend the existence of such speech codes? I'm not crazy about speech codes. I'm really okay. not. I really think the best solution to bad speech is more speech. I mean, okay, that's now a let me give you one. View. You're not crazy about speech codes. In putting together this show, our producer called a dozen or so very prominent liberal academics. Nobody wanted to defend speech codes in public. So the way it looks to this layman is that although you can't get anybody to defend speech codes in public, when they go into the faculty senate, they all vote for them. What's going on there? There's well, I've never voted for speech codes right. in my life. So again, I'm, I, all I can give you is my point of the view. American so I conducted major campaigns against speech codes and got whole universities to drop them. The AAUP has never conducted a campaign against speech codes. And you have the, 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 this is what happened at Harvard. There's a speech code. You cannot suggest that there might be difference in aptitudes between men and women, even though it's a scientific fact, at Harvard if you're the president. And where is the AUP defending the president of Harvard? They're not. Okay, David, let, me try, let me try this defense. Here's the defense for speech codes. The, the speech code that you just cited at Harvard is implicit, which, right? Yeah, it's much more effective okay. than an explicit one. You, how do you <laughs> challenge it? Okay, until only a couple of decades ago, tell me if you think this is a good defense. Institutions of higher learning represented the preserves largely, and especially the elite institutions. They were the preserves of students who were white, middle or upper middle class, and predominantly, or at many institutions, exclusively male. If colleges and universities are to educate students from all walks of life in this, the 21st century, then they have to make room for women, for the poor, for people of color, and here's the critical point, they have to make such people feel welcome. And yeah, they have to put limits on what people may or may not say to make this new influx of relatively new over the last couple of decades feel welcome. Reasonable? Well, it, of course, it sounds reasonable, but it's completely unreasonable in the practice. First of all, it presumes that Stanford or Berkeley, and I happen to have been there in 1960, were racist institutions, which is idiotic. You were at Berkeley in I was at Berkeley, yes. This welcome stuff, I will tell you right, exactly right. how it works. If somebody like myself uh, tries to print an ad on a college paper saying, 150 years after the fact, paying reparations uh, to the remote descendants of former slaves that might be a bad idea, uh, 40 of, of the papers shut that down. And where there were- You tried to take ads in student newspapers at, a, at 70, dozens of different 70 campuses. 70 across the country. Okay. And where the, it was printed, there were near riots, and just under this thing. It makes us feel unwelcome. They, they, it infantilizes these, uh, you know, the, the people who... Uh, Black uh, students or... Absolutely. Okay. They couldn't answer the ad. Go ahead, Graham. Graham. But I it think was shut down. David, let him talk. Go I ahead. believe, I think, David, that the legislation that you're proposing as an alternative to this purported problem infantilizes. Uh, SB 5 in California says that students should not take advantage of the immaturity of their students and so on and so on. Let's and that, to, to me... David's. We turn now to David Horowitz's Academic Bill of Rights. David Horowitz's proposed Academic Bill of Rights. Here are some of the central provisions. Hiring, firing, promoting, or granting tenure shall be on the basis of performance, not on the basis of political or religious beliefs. Tenure, search, and hiring committees will be recorded and available to duly authorized authorities and power to inquire into the integrity of the process. Students will be graded on their work, not their political beliefs or religion. Selection of speakers and other student activities will observe the principles of academic freedom and promote intellectual balance. Academic institutions and professional societies should maintain a posture of organizational neutrality. Two, two questions here. The second question is whether all of this ought to be mandated by state governments. You've got this, various versions of this are, are, have been introduced in how many state legislatures? About 20, but they were only because the AAUP wouldn't answer the phone. Okay, <laughs> okay. I wanted the them to be adopted question, by whether, whether, they should, whether this should be adopted and, and mandated by state legislatures. The first question is, in principle, do you have an objection to any one of those points in David's Academic Bill of Rights? Those points, on the whole, are part of what I described to Senator Morrow uh, in a debate a few weeks ago as the mom and apple pie part of the Academic Bill of Rights and the Student Bill of Rights, which are actually quite sanguine and uh, quite No problem quite with reasonable. anything that I've stated. Uh, I think, in general, those all sounded like they're, they're part of the sanguine Okay, part. what are the nasty bits of his uh, Academic Bill of Rights? The nasty bits uh, and the ones that affect, I, I really think, affect the learning process the most are the restraints on curriculum, 
Uh, it says that you know professors have to. I mean, some of the language I literally can't even understand. I mean, it says you you, you have There's to. There's the author. Go right. It says you have to uh, attest to the instability of all truth when putting together your, your curriculum, and then you have to get dissenting opinions in. And sometimes it's not about that. You know, if I'm teaching a, a course on printmaking, if I'm if I'm teaching a course that says. You know, this is, this is here's a, I'm, I teach art history, and so if I'm right. saying, you know, here's how you make a woodcut, here's how you make a lithograph, here's how you make uh, an etching or a Purely engraving. techniques. Yeah, and it's sometimes they're just There's informational. No I don't want to have partisan politics in that. I don't want to have dissenting views. I don't want to have, I don't want to have it turn into, you know, Hannity and Combs. This is such a caricature. What it says is, uh, since the assumption of our democracy even, is that uh, there is an uh, uncertainty, there's a areas of opinion Mm -hmm. There's an uncertainty to truth. Nobody has a monopoly of truth. That's why we have multi-party system. Otherwise, we'd have one party with the truth. Since that's the case, uh, in areas where there are opinion, uh, it's a matter of opinion, professors have a responsibility to make students aware of the spectrum of uh, scholarly opinion on the matter. It's just basic, simple, Common sense. I agree that it's common sense. I totally agree that, that, that one should have, uh, that, that one should make people aware. I don't think that there's legislation saying that that should happen in every, in every curriculum in every a, case. Look, we have withdrawn the legislation so in Colorado when the university said we'll do it. The, Hold on, tell us that story. That's a very important in story. In Colorado, we passed it through the education team. First, I was blown off. I visited with Elizabeth Hoffman, who's now no longer the head of Blown off by? Elizabeth Hoffman, the president of Ward Churchill's University. I told the University her, of Colorado. I told her she had okay. a brewing problem, and she said, no, we don't. Um, we went to the legislature. We got it by, uh, through the education committee. Immediately, Elizabeth Hoffman and the presidents of the other schools said, will you withdraw the legislation if we put these uh, guidelines in place? We said, absolutely. There was a memorandum of understanding. Take this University of Colorado instance. Is that a happy story? No, it's Do you not think a happy he, story. He push it, it's no, he's it's pushing them around? Why is that uh, an unhappy story? I certainly think he has a right to try to push through whatever legislations he wants. I, right. I, I, I completely respect that. Uh, I just, I, but I don't, you know, as far as I'm concerned, from the point of view of the professors and the students, if those kind right. of constraints are being put on by whoever, it doesn't really matter who it is, whether it's, uh, and, and one of the troubling things is that there's no, there's no plan for implementation in this. I mean, it's just like, yeah, someone's going to I just want to know your objection. You don't object to these points in principle. Well, the, so, most of the ones you cited, the ones, is, is, to the best of my memory, sound fine. And that's, like I say, that's the mom and apple pie part. Okay. And then there's the curriculum part, uh, for instance, uh, which I Okay, let me, again, trouble. let me go back to the University of Colorado and just ask you about that procedure. He gets the legislature involved. Does that make you nervous in and of itself? Or do you say, wait a minute, the University of Colorado exists on the backs of the taxpayers of Colorado is perfectly legitimate for the people's representatives to state what, they, what they'd like to go yeah, on Yeah, it really, it really scares me, the idea of letting, getting legislators involved. That's, uh, that's a real problem. Even at a state university. Peter, here, the mm -hmm. bottom line is... Hold on for a second. Sip some coffee for a second. Let me talk to this man for two minutes here. That's right. What is the AAUP doing to address at least the public perception of imbalance? The AAUP and has guidelines in place uh, about professorial conduct, about the importance of sticking to the curriculum, about the uh, impropriety of getting on a soapbox and, 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 you know, getting away from the curriculum. And they're very, very good guidelines, uh, and a lot of universities have instituted them, and I think it's important for them to institute them and to enforce them as well. I think it's important. Let me ask David Horowitz if he really wants the government intruding into ideological issues on college campuses. Columbia Professor of Journalism Todd Gitlin about you. Do the Crusaders meaning David Horowitz and a few others, but meaning principally you, do the Crusaders realize how patronizing they sound and how reckless? Should lawmakers who bean count the political loyalties of the faculties really serve as the proper judges of intellectual integrity? Whatever happened to small government? Close quote. Of course, the lawmakers are not. Here's the problem. In Ohio, the Ohio State uh, Faculty Handbook has most of my Bill of Rights right there as responsibilities of professors. The, the faculty is obviously not responding or adhering to it, and we could go chapter and verse. The administration is intimidated for the same reason that Larry Summers, I mean, they're not national figures like nice. Larry Summers. So the legislature has a fiduciary responsibility to say to the administrators to just weigh in and give them some weight vis-a-vis 
this, uh, uh, you know, these recalcitrant faculty members, the radicals. Uh, I've talked to the legislators in Ohio. They'd be perfectly willing to make the same kind of deal as in Colorado. Get on the record the university administration saying, yeah, we're going to enforce our rules, and better, we're going to make students aware that professors are not supposed to be showing Fahrenheit 9-11 in biology classes on the eve of elections, as happened. That's all it's about. It's just that's not all it's, it's getting that's not all them it's to about. behave. That's what has been the AAU response? The AAUP has posted on its website a vicious McCarthyite smear of me, picked up every piece of garbage on the internet, and where there's plenty. Are you against vicious McCarthyite smears, Mr. Horowitz? I am totally against vicious McCarthyite smears. Hmm. Graham, as David presents the case, he's going to legislatures as a last resort. He's tried the universities. The faculty is not responding. The administrations are, in many cases, too intimidated to hold the faculty to account. In a democracy, isn't it perfectly natural to go to the people and their representatives? Isn't that the proper recourse? I don't like this big hold government on. approach Listen. of... Of, of, inf of, of having the legislators come in and, and solve the purported yeah, problems of the look, university. I don't, that's I why really I, don't I object to you calling them liberals, because they're, they, they hate democracy. This is what democracy is. Stephen, guys, Stephen Beck, graduate, recent graduate of Dartmouth, where he was editor of the mother of all conservative mm -hmm. campus newspapers, Dartmouth Review. He writes, the con campus conservatives need to toughen up, quote, folks meet the crybabies, close quote. In other words, says this recent Dartmouth grad, who is a thoroughgoing conservative, spending four years deepening their thinking and honing their polemical, skill, polemical skills on liberal campuses does conservative students good. Uh, I agree. Here, here. I think it does liberal students really bad. Sure. If you have very strong ties to uh, you know, the conservative culture, National Review, Young America's Foundation, and so forth, um, these for bu getting bullied by le leftists well, will, you have the personal integrity will, to stand will make up you tough. Any ties to Ninety percent of the students that's not going to happen with. Graham, go ahead. I think the Dartmouth student is right. I think this Dartmouth conservative is, is right to say that it strengthens uh, that, that it strengthened him. A lot of students uh, just the other yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, a student in Florida, cons very conservative student, came out and said the same thing. He said that there actually is open discourse. He said that, uh, that, that and, and that he really thinks he's, he's against the crybabies, so too. He's, is, he's against the crybabies. Finally, predictions on the future of David's academic Bill of Rights. The academic Bill of Rights has been enacted in zero state legislatures, although introduced in about 20. And yeah, well, oh, yeah, okay. people have to understand legislatures only meet in the spring, usually. Right. Some of them only meet for 40 weeks. Five years from now, prediction, five years from now, how many state legislators, legislatures will actually have enacted David Horowitz's Academic Bill of Rights. Take a guess. I think very few. Uh, you don't see any. momentum in their direction. I really don't. And, if, and, and in fact, uh, it's, it's been very encouraging in recent weeks, especially in light of, uh, for instance, the Schiavo, uh, um, you know, How sort does of that play thing in Florida. Academic well, academic it's about, pe it's a, it's about uh, the government coming into people's lives and mandating such okay. things. In how, this many, case, how many? How many? Similar to government mandate. What's going to happen is this battle will go on. And my main agenda has never been legislation, as I told you. Uh, you want the University of Colorado experience. I want repeated. the universities to change. I don't want them to become under the legislatures. A legislator is just a wake up. Uh, what, I, what, what my agenda is, is to transform a whole student generation uh, to be active in its own interest, including liberal students. Because when liberal students go to these schools, they never hear the conservative case. And they are getting, it's the dumbing down now, the of the political left. the students have come out en masse against the Academic Bill of Rights. And student organizations all over the country have come out last in, vehemently against last it. Question. So we're let them, so let them decide that. for themselves, David. Don't, don't, don't tell them. The question about, we talked about students. question about faculties and generational change at these universities. The ratio, I'm quoting another study now, <clears throat> the ratio of Democrats to Republicans in humanities faculties is today roughly 7 to 1 according to several surveys. A decade from now, will that ratio have changed? Well, you know how I feel about these, about, about these, uh, these surveys. I mean, I'm, I don't, the I'd, like to, I'd like to see the details of the survey, the, and I have no idea. They go around a bunch of people and say, the study was I don't with the the study, study, I don't, generational change the in the coming in faculties. In what sense? In the ideological it's sense. Be yeah, of course things are going to change ideologically. I don't think it's a simple move from a left to right spectrum or vice versa. Okay. David, we know the answer. What do you think? I mean, that Dan Klein is a professor of economics at Santa Clara who conducted the study, and it was done with interviews, also studied 
uh, Berkeley and Stanford, where we are, and showed that among junior professors, right. it's seven to one among all professors, left over uh, conservative. Among junior professors, associates and assistants, it's 30 to one. So it's getting worse. There is a blacklist in place that's been in place for 30 years, and until that blacklist is cracked, and that's a very complicated is a way to so do the it. government's got to come in and fix it with speech no, control and thought control. You're, 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 the, you're the guys who love the government. Someone's got to fix it with speech. I know. I don't love. I'm trying to keep the government no, out, David. I'm you're the one who's legislating in 20 listen, states. I'm, not, I'm keeping the government I, out. I you're am, putting I'm them in. I'm not going to lay out my plan here, but the basic plan, I will, the, the basic idea is, people have to become aware of the problem, Graham and Larkin. they have to get up and fight. Graham Larkin, David Horowitz, thank you very much. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us. We welcome your comments on this week's show. Our email address, comments at uncommonknowledge.tv. For more information about